Right, we are recording. Okay, we haven't got too any more in the waiting room at the moment from what I can see. So I think if we start and then I can admit people as they come, um, otherwise we'll be waiting maybe for a, a while, but yeah. welcome everybody. It's really lovely to have so many faces, so many people um, listening in. Uh, normally at Gwen Wildlife Trust, we, we um, have a really extensive events program planned now across the year, but um, obviously due to COVID, we haven't been able to this year. Um, so we thought we would try and do some of the spring Zoom sessions. So everything's coming out now with the warmer weather starting. We thought people might just like to start getting their eye in a bit and, and, and help you on your daily walks. Just keep an eye out for things that are starting to appear. So we've got Andy Caron, who's our senior ecologist, and, and he's gonna take us through some things that we can all look out for um, over the coming weeks. Um, we have, as you know, we are a charity, and so we are um, we are obviously struggling quite a lot this year with our fundraising. So do consider after these sessions to, if you're not already, become a member of Grand Wildlife Trust or support us by donating, um, uh, just making a donation to these. Because obviously, these are free, so do consider that. So if I can now um, hand over to Andy, one thing I will say is that we are going to, uh, if I can ask you if you've got any questions, to um, write them in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen there and then when Andy comes to a suitable um, stop I can I can ask them of him and um, we can go from there that'd be great because I think there's too many people to be asking um, taking people off mute and asking questions so that'd be great so I hope everyone knows how to use the chat function um, and then also I think Andy will have an opportunity as well at the end for people to ask questions as well Okay, so Andy, if I pass over to you. Marvis, thank you very much. Right, I'm going to try and share my screen. There we go. I want that out of the way. There we go. Right, yo, is that a is that working for everybody? That all looks good to me, yeah. Righty ho. Right, oh, thank you, Gemma. Right, as Gemma said, we normally have all these events going on, but we can't at the moment. But I would like to think that we will, maybe in a couple of months' time, have lots of events and we'd like to see all your faces there out in the field. But as for now, we can't really. So we've got four talks, so that there'll be one tonight, obviously, and then fortnightly up until the end of the end of April. So tonight is signs of early spring so there we go so we got tonight 18th of march and then we got first of april 15th of april and 29th of april so spring it's my favorite time of year i'm quite fond of autumn i kind of like summer as well winter isn't so bad but spring i'd say is definitely definitely my favorite so there's a there's new life we've got warmer days there's more daylight and this year particularly is hopefully restrictions are, e restrictions are easing so we can get out and do more. And there's all sorts of new things to see and so it energizes and enthuses me. And I think it does the same for the wildlife and hopefully the same for, same for everybody else. So, so, but it's a funny time of year, sort of early spring. It can be lovely and warm. The last few days we've had sort of lovely, lovely warm spring days, but uh, I was out at the weekend and uh, I was in a hailstorm and it was it was horrible. So it just shows sort of how it can contrast so much this time of year. So really, if you're early spring wildlife, if you're sort of in the brave spring vanguard, you've got to be pretty tough. And we're going to sort of uh, look at what's out now, all these sort of tough spring species. And then, and then over the coming weeks, we'll see what other ones are going to sort of follow later on in spring. So tonight we're going to look at sort of five different topics. We've got our sort of breeding amphibians, we've got early spring migrants, and we're going to say a fond farewell to our winter visitors. Talk about who's emerged from hibernation and look at some early spring flowers. And uh, I think Gemma mentioned there'll be a Q and A. So there's a chat box. 
if you can type any questions in there, I shall try and sort of pick them up as we go along and maybe look at at the end of each of the five topics, but there'll be hopefully plenty of time at the end for questions and nothing too difficult, please. It's getting to that time in the evening, my brain's slowing down, so nothing too, uh, nothing too taxing for me. Uh, so we're gonna start off with amphibians. So here in Gwent, we have five native amphibians. We've got our common frog, we've got our common toad, and then we've got our three species of newt. We've got the great crested newt, the palmate newt, and the smooth or common newt. And uh, if you want to know about the newts, you've got to come along in two weeks time. There's an incentive for you, because uh, I always think the really early sort of season amphibians are the frog and the, and the toad, particularly the frog. You know, the frog sort of can be out in, into the January time, really. And uh, the toads maybe a bit more now. I know the newts are about now, but their breeding season sort of, it goes on a bit, on a bit longer. So we're going to start with the common frog. And I should warn people, we hopefully got some sounds. So don't be alarmed. This isn't my tummy rumbling coming up. So that was the sound of a, of a male frog in the pond croaking away to try and entice the females in. And uh, I can imagine now one of the questions you may ask is how to get rid of all the duckweed in my pond, because people quite often ask that. But this photograph here is my pond, and that's the amount of duckweed I've got. So don't go asking me how to get rid of it, because I haven't got a clue. It's absolutely coated, and I can't, can't get shot of it. But uh, this is like a frog in my pond. and. Generally, about this time of year, I have maybe 70 odd frogs in my pond. But last year, I had just one frog in my pond, one lot of frog spawn that wasn't fertilized, no tadpoles. And this year, I had a lone, a lone male frog croaking away, and not a single other frog turned up. So I've got no frog spawn at all. So I don't really know what's happened, but there's, there's various diseases that affect our amphibians. There's a this sort of chytrid fungus disease. And there's Rana virus as well, which also known as red leg. So I fear that over the last couple of years, I've probably had some almost echoing what's gone on in the bigger world with coronavirus. I've had viruses in my garden and it's, it's virtually killed off my, my frog population. But this happened about eight years ago and eventually all came back again. So it's not all doom and gloom. I think they can sort of recover. There'll be a few that are immune to it and the population will build back up. But it's bit of a sad state of affairs really but the, the frog's there in the pond and he croaks away and hopefully the females get attracted in and the females come along and then they have a lovely big special hug as I like to call it but that so the scientific term for this is amplexus so that the male frog sort of gives the female frog a hug she lays her lays her spawn and he he fertilizes the frog spawn and it's not on this photograph as well it's sort of nice to look at because if I was to draw a frog with my limited artistic skills, it would be, it would just be green. But there's, there's pinks here, light browns, dark browns, blacks, yellows, oranges, greens, olives. There's all sorts on there. So it's, it's quite interesting just how many different colors there are on a frog and, and how the two of them, how the two of them vary so much as well. But after all of that, you'll have your frog spawn there in the pond. And obviously that will hatch out into tadpoles and the like, but that's that's a story for another day, really, because this is this is roughly where we are now. The frogs spawn in the in the pond, and then the other one we have at this time of year is the toad. Obviously, it looks quite a lot like a frog, but you can see kind of drier skin and a lot more warty, and it's got this sort of ridge coming back from the back of its eye. Sort of all nasty chemicals can come out of there if if something decides to eat it, makes it all distasteful. And uh, another way to tell them apart is that the frogs tend to hop and the toad sort of runs or walks kind of thing. But they'll be, they'll be going to our ponds now and uh, maybe not this year, but it's, it's worth trying to sign up. There's various like toad, patrol, toad patrols because uh, they're very vulnerable to getting, they tend to go en masse on one, one wet night, they all go to the pond together and they can get run over if they cross the road. So there's, uh, there's various toad patrols to set up, I think by Frog Life, but I'm signed up to one of them. So maybe not this year, but in future years, people might want to sign up to a toad patrol and help them get across 
across the road safely. And, uh, and the frog spawn, the toad spawn is very different to that frog spawn. You saw the frog spawn in all one big, one big mass, but the toads lay it all in, in a big long string. So there we go, that is the end of the uh, amphibians. Do we have any questions at all, Gemma, at the moment, or I shall go on to the next bit? No questions at the moment, Andy. There we go, that's nice and easy. I was gonna say that's how I like it, but I would like to have some questions at some point. Right, uh, so now we've got our early spring migrants. So uh, our summer visitors, they're just starting to sort of trickle in now. We've got loads more coming, but there's a few early ones to look out for at the moment. So we have uh, probably the three main ones that are just coming in, uh, wheat ears and sand martens and, and chip chaps. So uh, it's a wheat ear, it's a male wheat ear. Uh, one of my favorite birds, a real, real lovely looking thing. So they'll just be sort of arriving in Gwent about now. And probably the best place to see them about now is probably down, down on the edge of the level, sort of at the coast, because the, the migrants just making making landfall there really. So uh, along the seawall is a good place to good place to see them this time of year. But then they quickly move inland and they they're breeding sort of up in in our uplands. So places like up on the Blorange will be pairs of them throughout the summer. So we, we I think there's even some some wheat ears have made it into the UK, I think in February this year. So we we'll have a few of them arriving now, but then there's a second batch of wheat ears come in Sort of late late April May time, and that they're migrating to somewhere different. The ones we've got at the moment are heading further north in the UK, but we get a second batch end of April May, and they're all going to then set off across the Atlantic to Greenland, which is a bit of a, a mad migration to be honest. But all the ones we're getting now are sort of our more local more local wheat ears, and obviously some will some will stay to breed. And I'm uh, I'm always very conscious when I do a talk or anything. I always use photographs of all the male birds because they generally kind of look a bit nicer. So I'm going to redress the balance a bit here. And this is a, a female wheat here, which is an equally, equally nice bird, a bit more drab, but she's also showing her white rump here, which is important. It's a really good identification sort of feature of a wheat ear. When it flies off in front of you, you'll see this white rump. And that's actually how they get their name because wheat ear has nothing to do with like an ear of wheat. It's actually derived from old English for white arse. So it's basically got a white arse. There we go. So, uh, and we've made it all a bit more sanitized and nice now. That's the, that's the theme. And that was a, that was a sound hopefully you heard of it. San Martin there, so that they'll be arriving about now as well. So if you happen to be walking on any of our rivers, particularly the wine and especially the Osk, uh, the first few San Martins will be arriving and sort of flying, migrating up our rivers. And uh, very similar to our house Martins, which nest in our houses, but the San Martin nests in, in sort of banks on our, on our rivers. So they dig a dig a hole, maybe up to almost a meter, a meter long, sort of into the bank, and that's where they have their have their nest, which is obviously a very safe place to to have your have your chicks because you're protected by the by the river. But sadly, sometimes just at the wrong time of year, there can be a bit of a flood or a downpour, and the whole the whole river can rise, and all the nests get flooded, or the whole all the nests get get washed away. And I, I know this happened a couple of sites in in Gwent last year, but I think Torvine in the last week or so, they've created some artificial, artificial sort of San, Mar San Martin banks, which is, which is great. So hopefully they'll be getting used, used this year. So if, if you do get out and about, particularly if you can make it down to maybe Castle Meadows and Abergavenny, if you look over the opposite side of the, of the, of the Usk from uh, Castle Meadows, there's a lovely San Martin colony there and you can just watch them flying back and forward all day long, really. Real nice. Uh, and then next we're going to have so I shouldn't need to introduce that because it introduced itself by saying chip chaff. Well, not quite, but 
that's where they get their name. They're very sort of distinctive chiff chaff songs. That's I always think that's a real sign that early spring is here when you hear your first first chiff chaff singing. And we do have some chiff chaffs that sort of over winter with us, but uh, there should be now our first sort of migrants arriving and setting up territory and starting to starting to sing away and. Uh, very similar to our willow warbler, which generally arrives a few weeks later. And it was only a few hundred years ago they actually thought they were the same, the same species. But uh, it was Gilbert White, sort of famous naturalist, sort of divided off the wood warbler, the willow warbler, and the chiff chaff into, into three different species. But you can kind of tell them apart, obviously, by their song. But uh, the chiff chaff has sort of darker legs. And if you, and it, it looks more like a chiff chaff, really, but uh, it has so, slightly shorter wings as well. So the, the length of the primaries on the wings is shorter than on a willow warbler because they, they only migrate as far as like Spain and maybe North Africa, whereas our willow warblers are migrating all the way down to sub-Saharan Africa. So they need that subtly longer wing to fly that longer distance. Right, that is the end of our so early, early spring migrants. Have we got any questions? Still no, no questions yet, Andy, but I've got go. one. Oh, could, there we go. Thank you. Could you, um, could you tell us why, why is it, what is it that suddenly sets off the birds like the chiff chaff singing? Because I heard my first chiff chaff a few days ago. What is it that suddenly makes them start singing? I think, I think various things stimulate sort of different, different birds, really. I think day length is a big factor in in lots of sort of things, sort of doing things and temperature as well. I would imagine if it was a really grotty day, they might not sing as much. But I think I I, I kind of like to think when we have a nice warm spring day, I kind of leap out of bed a bit more and and I sing in the shower and all that kind of stuff. So maybe a chick jack just has this certain joy de vivre and sort of hey, it's springtime. But, yeah, I think I think certainly day length is a is a factor, but I, I sometimes wonder because a lot of our migrants they don't how do they know what it's going to be like here in two months' time? They're down in Africa and it's just it's kind of sunny down there, but obviously something is a trigger thousands of miles away which sets them off on their way back here to arrive back here just at the just at the right time. So there's yeah, I think there's lots of lots of things in play really. Uh, right, and now we're going to say a fond oh, uh, Andy, oh. we've suddenly we've got a question come in. Excellent. About how many babies, it's quite a specific question, about how many babies a her do herons normally have? How many babies do herons have? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. They, I know they'll have, generally, the bigger a bird, the less babies it has. So like your, your blue tits in your nest box may have like 10 of them because they're, they're sort of smaller and they're, they're not as longer lived, whereas a heron will put more effort into producing one big one. But I think, I think they can have maybe two or three eggs in the nest, but quite often with some of these bigger birds, there might be only one of them actually, actually makes it to adulthood, I think can be a bit a bit cutthroat in the nest to some of these some of these birds. I know there's a sort of a similar kind of bird, a shoebill stork in Africa. I think basically they have a few they have a few sort of babies and only one of them ever makes it to adulthood because generally the first one hatched sees off the other ones. But I think I think they maybe have two or three, don't quote me on this, but I think maybe two or three in the nest. And if, if it's a good if it's a good season and they get lots of food in, they may all they may all survive. But if it's if it's slim pickings, then it might just be the the one strongest chick that'll that'll make it to the end. But yeah, the herons that they're one of the ones that they nest early, so that they, they'll be up on their heronries now because it takes it takes a long time to get a a heron from being an egg to being an adult. So yeah, they, they have to nest nest early. Whereas other things, like a, I think like a blue tit, it'll take only two weeks from the egg hatching to the, the chick fledging kind of thing. 
there we go. Great, thank you. That's we, and we've got another one from a from a familiar colleague asking what what your favourite bird song in spring is. My favourite bird song. Oh, I get quite excited by a willow warbler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It just sort of I just associate that with I don't know being in nice places just at around about Easter time and I think. At the moment, spring can be a little bit, a little bit iffy. But by the time you hear your first willow warbler, then spring really is, really is there, and it's almost there's no turning back. Then it's it's onwards and upwards to better weather kind of thing, and it is quite a nice, a nice sort of, I don't know, mellow but uplifting little warble. <laughs> that was a rough answer. <laughs> there we That's go. It for now. Right, yeah. So we've just been discussing sort of our sort of spring, summer migrants. We tend to think of everything coming in, but actually there's a second migration going going on at the moment as well. Sort of there's all our winter visitors are actually leaving us and they're actually spring, summer migrants for some other people. So if you're up in Scandinavia, up in if you're up in the Arctic Circle or Russia, then things that we think of as being our winter visitors are actually their sort of spring migrants. So things like red wings and field fairs will be arriving there quite soon. So, so we're going to be saying goodbye to our red wings and field fairs, goodbye to our ducks and our geese and our swans, and also goodbye to sort of continental populations of some of our, some of our resident birds. That's a, that's a field fair there, which one of my favourite birds. I love all the different sort of subtle, subtle colours on it. And uh, they obviously came to visit us for the, for the winter. They all arrived last sort of October, November, and they spent the winter with us. But now they're heading, heading back north, back up to Scandinavia. So they'll, they'll have been with us sort of, if the ground isn't frozen, they'll have been eating our worms, but they'll have been eating all our berries. And they've been on our windfall apples, which this one is. So they've got lots of lots of traditional orchards here in here in Gwent. So they'll have been taking advantage of that. But I think all our all our bushes now are probably stripped of berries, probably apart from the ivy. All the windfall apples are eaten. They're all they're all sort of heading heading back north now. And uh, generally, whenever I think of a field fair, I think of the red wing as well. So field fair and red wing are both both thrushes. This obviously looks quite like our sort of more familiar song thrush, but you can see the sort of ready, ready orange underneath its underneath its wing and uh, and the big sort of, sort of pale eye stripes. So they, they'll be again heading back up to the forests of Norway to breed. And then uh, all our ducks are down on the Seven Estuary. We have sort of international and national important duck populations as part of the special area of conservation and special protection areas that cover cover that hugely important part of Gwent. This is a shoveler. You can sort of see where it gets its name from its its big shovel-like bill. So I think I think shoveler have maybe nested in Gwent maybe on a handful of occasions, but we have hundreds of them down on the on the estuary sort of feasting on all the things in the mud over the winter. But they'll all be they'll all be leaving us now as well and they'll be all probably into the up past the Arctic Circle, even possibly sort of right up into the Arctic Russia. It's huge migrations they'll do. So we'll be saying goodbye to them. And then uh, there's lots of the ducks we have sort of on our on our inland waters, inland waters as well. It's like a potsherd, really nice duck. I really like the the plumage on the back of it. From a distance, you think that's just sort of grey, but if you sort of look at it, there's all these subtle little wiggly stripes and all sorts all over, it, and a, an amazing eye on it as well. So again, these will be these will be heading sort of a lot further north now. Won't be back to us until next next autumn. And as well as all the as all the wild fowl, we have uh, we have the waders as well. So there's uh, there's lots of waders again down on the down on the Seven Estuary. There's a uh, big flocks of dunlin and ring plover and knot and curlew, and very few of them stay to breed with us. And they'll all be heading heading further north as well. This is a this is a turnstone. This gets its name from 
it doesn't have as long a bill as lots of the other waders for probing down in the mud, so it uses its shorter but stockier bill for flipping over stones and grabbing all the little little sand hoppers underneath. So again, there's you know, flocks of them down on the Seven Estuary, but none of them will stay with us to breed, and they'll all be they'll all be starting to think about about heading north now. And uh, as well as sort of all these other birds which are departing from us, we have all these sort of familiar garden birds which we may not realise are actually, uh, a lot of them aren't actually our resident birds, like our robins, our blackbirds, our chaffinches, all there. They all, uh, we have huge, hugely more of them in the winter. And uh, you know, the familiar robin in your back garden may not actually be the resident robin. It may be about to head off back, back across to the continent, back to Germany or back up into, into Scandinavia. And then uh, we have our black cap there as well, which we didn't used to really get many of them spending the winter with us at all. But recently we've had quite a few do spend the winter with us, but all the ones that spend the winter with us won't be the ones which we'll hear singing in a few weeks time. Our wintering black caps will fly back to Germany and then we'll get fresh black caps arriving in the next few weeks from down in Spain and North and Northern Africa. And I kind of think they should maybe all get together, the black caps, and kind of say, well, I tell you what, we'll just stay here and then you go to Germany and then we don't have to do anything. But they don't do that. So they all have these different, different sort of migration strategies going on. Right, that is the end of saying goodbye to our winter visitors. So <laughs> have you got any questions on that? Oh. Yeah, we have got a few, Andy. So, um, oh. I'll ask the last one because it's relevant to what you were just saying. Uh, Rachel Morgan's asking, why do they swap? Why do, what, the black caps? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's only fairly recently that we even started getting wintering black caps. And I think initially it was assumed it was just some of our summering black caps had decided, oh, maybe it's a bit milder here in the winter. We won't bother flying, flying south. But then from... British Trust for Ornithology doing all their ringing studies, they actually realised that the black caps we have in winter aren't our summer black caps, they were actually migrating from Germany. So they've obviously, the ones there maybe decided not to do quite a bigger migration, it's probably easier just to go a little bit westwards into the UK than go all the way down to into Spain and Africa. But yeah, it would make sense if, if our ones just stayed with us and then those ones did their thing, but... Someone needs to have a word on them. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got Marilyn and John are asking, when could we hope to see ring oozles? Ring oozles? Well, ring oozles, again, one of the early migrants, and I almost put in a bit about ring oozles because they are one of the earliest ones to arrive. They could, we could have our first ones arriving any day now, but I didn't put them in because sadly they're extinct as a breeding bird now in Gwent. Because uh, I was, I've just been recently writing the Ring Oozel chapter for the Greater Gwent State of Nature report, which will be I think, coming out later on this year. But uh, it all made a bit sad reading because I was looking at all the historical numbers of Ring Oozels in Gwent, and you know, they used to be breeding on the Blorange and various sites down the, you know, down down the various sort of uh, valleys in the in the west of Gwent. But gradually their numbers dropped and dropped. And then the only pairs that were left were at Treville Quarry, right up in the northwest corner of Gwent. And they hung on there until maybe 15 years ago. And I don't think there's been a breeding record in Gwent since then. So you'd be quite lucky to see a, a ring oozle. If you if you want to see a ring oozle, I think Treville Quarries are still your best bet in Gwent, or you may possibly see them may get one passing through on the Blorange, but it's probably about this time of year and into, into April's the time to see them, but you've probably got more chance of seeing a ring oozle in the autumn up on the hills mixed in with you know, flocks of my, other migrating thrushes on the, on the hawthorn berries. But the, if you do want to see a ring oozle, the nearest site where they are still breeding is, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, in the Breton Beacons, uh, Try Kerrig Glaciad, which is just off the A470, not far on from Story Arms. 
they're a little bit outside of Gwent, but they're uh, they're still hanging on there. I think I'm allowed to tell people that. I think it's I think it's commonly known that they that they do breed there. So don't anybody go there and nick their eggs, please. <laughs> Not that anybody's going to, but uh, but yeah, they that they do still breed there, and it's, it's a lovely site that is actually. I can dig up somewhere that's out of Gwent as well, but it's a big sort of natural natural amphitheatre. And there's yeah, there's red start there and wind chat and and all sorts of cuckoo and stuff. So that's once we can get out and explore a bit more, that's that's a worthwhile walk. That sort of in in May time and not too far from not too far from Gwent. And um, we've also we've got a question about: Is there anywhere in Gwent where you can see mandarin ducks? Mandarin ducks. There is. Uh, I know they're on the Y in various places. I don't know exact place on the Y and on the Mono as well. So I think but both of those rivers, if you went for a, a river walk, but this time of year, I think they're harder to harder to see because it's getting around the breeding season. They all become a lot more a lot more secretive. But yeah, they're certainly on certainly on those two those two rivers. And then obviously if you go into the Forest of Dean, if you go to Cannock Ponds in the Forest of Dean, there's no end of Mandarin ducks there there it's coated in them but it's actually nice to see one in Gwent so so I think I think a walk along the mono would might be your best your best bet and um, someone's just asking about the previous question as well just about why the the ring oozles have declined so dra drama dramatically in Gwent yeah there's, there's a species which is which has declined across the whole of the UK so it's not just it's not just Gwent, I suppose. There's other places maybe had lots more ring oozle and their numbers have dropped, but they're still enough to be there. There was never a huge number in Gwent, so it didn't take all that much to tip us, tip us over the edge, really. Uh, with sort of global warming and climate change, things are getting a bit warmer. And another name for the ring oozle is the mountain blackbird. So they, they certainly nest higher up. And as, as things get sort of milder, I think they're going to get gradually pushed higher and higher up to up, up mountains. And we haven't got anywhere all that high in Gwent. So, yeah, they're still doing reasonably well, I think, in Snowdonia, where there is the higher peaks. Uh, and also, I was sort of reading this, you need, it has sort of quite specific habitat requirements. I think it needs rocky areas, sort of rocky outcrops. Also needs a quite closely uh, grazed turf for it to be able to probe about in to get its worms, but it also needs sort of longer vegetation, sort of bilberry and heather nearby for, for nesting in. And if you don't have the right balance of grazing on our uplands, it can it can quickly throw that off balance. If there isn't enough grazing, there won't be any sort of close grazed turf to get the worms out of and too much grazing and there won't be any 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 other vegetation so it's it's getting the balance the balance right really and treble quarries obviously was for whatever reason just at a nice level and i don't know whether that you know the management there has changed or whether it is just the general decline and there was only a few pairs and now they've and now they've gone but i think it's potentially a species we could get back in gwent but I think it would need sort of probably large areas of our uplands to be managed in a reasonably specific way, I think. But I'm sure that would have benefits for other species as well. So, you know, I think it's quite possible levels of sheep grazing may change in the future and this may be beneficial or not beneficial. I guess it remains to be, remains to be seen. Okay, and then a final question at the moment is about how we can attract the spring and summer migrants uh, to visit our gardens. Right. Well, it's a lot easier to attract our winter visitors by putting food out for them. But our, I suppose the birds that are here for spring and summer, they want somewhere to nest and they want lots of food for their, for their chicks. So if you can have sort of bushes in your garden, areas of bramble patches where they can put nests, if you have ivy, where they can get their nests hidden away and obviously you can put up put up bird boxes 
but the bird boxes tend to be used more by you know our blue tits and our great tits but if you have like an open fronted nest box you, and a slightly bigger garden you could get spotted fly catchers in you sort of uh, put that there for them uh, if you're a bit more out in the sticks you know, there's possibility of getting pied fly catchers and red starts in your garden but in a more conventional garden a lot of your summer migrants may just be sort of passing through i suppose but if you have lots of if you have lots of nectar sources that'll bring in the insects and if the insects are there then the birds will be there so don't go ripping all your all your dandelions out your lawn and stuff because that'll bring in the insects and the insects will bring in the bring in the birds and then you've got those you've got things like house martins which are us you know spring migrants and swifts which nest in our houses so we can we can all make our houses more friendly for these you know i'd like to see sort of new houses all being built with you know gaps for house sparrows and swifts and and areas where house martins can attach their can attach their nests so there's all that you can buy artificial house martin boxes as well which you can put on the on the outside of your house and if you get one in then you might get a colony sort of started up but you have to be make sure you put them in the right place if all the nest boxes they generally want to be facing the north or northeast away from the prevailing wind because you don't want all that rain being blown into them and you don't want them south facing because you're going to just slow roast some chicks so so it's yeah it's all it's all these things it's just general and just general maybe having your garden just that little bit wilder will just you know attract things in and if you can encourage all your neighbors to do the same because if you have a bigger area of nice habitat there's more chance of of attracting things in really whereas if you're just the one the one wildlife friendly garden it's maybe not such a, a tempting oasis for a, a bird that happens to be flying over there Thank you, that's all the questions uh, for the moment, Andy. Right, yeah. Thank you. Right, we're gonna see who's emerged from hibernation. We've already looked at the amphibians, who sort of they're all sort of out and about now, really. But our dormice, they're particularly lazy, and they're going to still be fast asleep. Uh, but we'll we'll come on to them in a in a later a later talk. And our hedgehogs may or may not be sort of awake now, but I did see a hedgehog on yesterday was it yesterday i think so sadly it was dead probably didn't need to know that i probably just made it a nice happy story but uh that was a that's a hedgehog that's out of hibernation now so that they're just starting to come out but as i said earlier it's a funny time of year it, it, it's more it's more likely to snow at easter than it is at christmas so it you know could possibly we could still have a freeze on the way so things may go back into may go back into hibernation but yeah we should have our amphibians out now, maybe some hedgehogs, and then some of our butterflies, which hibernate, will be out, out now. So we have, I think, fifty-nine different species of butterfly in the UK, and five of them, five of them hibernate. So we have the brimstone, the comma, small tortoise shell, red admiral, and peacock are the only ones that hibernate. Well, I should say hibernate as a, as a butterfly, because they all have to get through the winter by some kind of strategy. So most of our brown butterflies get through the winter as caterpillars. Most of our like hair streaks and the like get through the winter as uh, eggs. And most of our white butterflies get through the winter as chrysalises. So there's all sorts of different strategies for getting through the getting through the winter. I think if I had to get through the winter, I'd prefer to be a chrysalis, I think. That seems like the nicest way to, to hibernate, just wrapped up in that, just having a having a nice kick. But Anyone that's been a chrysalis probably won't be out yet. The butterflies that are out now are the ones that came came through the winter actually as a butterfly, and all it takes is a little bit of warm weather, and they'll be up, up and out kind of thing. And then sort of reptiles are sort of coming out of hibernation now. Got our adders and adders, I think, come out particularly sort of early, and sort of basking near their hibernation site. So if you see, if you happen to see an adder this time of year, then. You can almost guarantee that its hibernation site is very nearby and uh, if you do see an adder it'd be great if you could send your records into Subrec which is a South, South East Wales biological recording centre in fact anything you see you can send into there but particularly things like adders because uh, their populations are down and I think they're under recorded 
but particularly records this time of year, that would help people pinpoint actually where their hibernation sites are. And they're, they're the particular important areas to, to conserve. And our common lizards will be out as well. They're all basking in the early, early spring sunshine. And I'm sure a lot of you will have seen uh, probably queen bumblebees as well, that they spend the winter, all the other, all the other bumblebees, of, all the workers did their job and died, but the queen survives the winter ready to start off a start off a new nest. So again, they're out sort of on our early, early spring flowers, getting a bit of a bit of nectar. So here we go. We're going to look at our five species of hibernating butterfly. This is the brimstone. And uh, the brimstone has an interesting story to it because there's, there's basically two schools of thought where, where the word butterfly comes from. Uh, some people say it's because somebody saw one fly by and they said, oh, look at that flutter by. And then it became a butterfly. But the other school of thought is that someone saw a fly and it was the colour of butter. And uh, they think that was probably the brimstone butterfly, which you can see is very much butter coloured. So they call that, that a butterfly. And then that became the term used for, for all butterflies. And, uh, and these, these sort of hibernate, so they, they hide away in like dense ivy and stuff. So if you have dense ivy in the garden, I know some people like to cut down the ivy, but ivy is a great plant. It's, it's the only plant that will be providing any berries to any, any creatures this time of year. And things like the brimstone butterfly, that's where they'll be where they'll be hibernating. And then we have the comma, which this hibernate, there's not, not a lot known about the hibernating uh, commas, because uh, as you can see there, when it's got its wings folded up, it looks just like a, a dead leaf. Even the, the tatty edge of its wing makes it look particularly like a dead leaf. And uh, this is incredibly hard to find when they hibernate. So people aren't entirely sure where they do hibernate, but it might be almost down in the leaf litter or you know, the base of trees, I, I don't know really. And you can see on its underwing there why it gets its, its name, the comma. You can see the little, little punctuation, punctuation mark there. And then the next three, we, sort of, we know a lot more about their hibernating habits because they, sort of, they hibernate in caves and hollow trees, which also means if we have outhouses, they just treat that as a cave. So some of you may have seen like hibernating butterflies in, a, in maybe a shed or whatever, and that will be either the, the small tortoise shell and then the next two, which are the, the red admiral, and I forget the other one it's going to be. And the peacock, there we go. Let me go back again. Uh, so, uh, small tortoise shell, this is probably the first one you might see on the wing, maybe this and the, the brimstone, the ones you're most likely to see this time of year. And uh, these three butterflies, uh, and the comet to some extent, their caterpillars feed on stinging nettles. So, you may have stinging nettles in your garden and you might want to get rid of them. But if you want to have all these lovely colourful butterflies in the spring and summer, then you need to sort of leave a little, little wild air in your garden with some stinging nettles for their, for their caterpillars to eat. And there we've got the, the red admiral there. Again, really, really lovely thing. But uh, it's only fairly recently these, these have started hibernating in the UK because we think of them as like a resident butterfly or a familiar one, but really they're a migrant. And most of the red admirals we will see in maybe May time are actually all birds, not birds, they're butterflies that have migrated up from, from Africa and Southern Europe. But we do have a few which, which hibernate. And uh, any, any we see sort of this time of year, probably ones that have hibernated in, in a cave somewhere or some outbuilding. And then finally we have the, uh, the peacock, which, uh, which again, Caterpillars are feeding on stinging nettles. And you can see it's it's nectaring here on thistles, which is another plant we try and get rid of, but it shows the value of both thistles and, and nettles to our to our wildlife. But again, they'll come out of hibernation. A few will make it through hibernation. They'll lay there, lay their eggs fairly soon. They'll chomp down all our nettles. And then that's why we get a huge number of sort of peacocks in the summer, because that's the young from our hibernating ones. And then they're all out sort of July, August time, sort of, and all our buddlier and the like. And then uh, I was going to warn people there was a snake coming up. Some people are afraid of snakes. If I showed this photograph to my mum, she'd probably faint and be sick at the same time. So just a warning. There's a snake coming up, everybody. There we go. This is, this is the adder. 
So uh, these will be out, they can be out as early as February, but this is a really good time of year to sort of go looking for adders. And obviously they are venomous, but they're not going to do you any harm if you don't disturb them. And uh, they're likely just to, to crawl away kind of thing. But on a, on a sort of spring day like this, they'll be out early in the morning on a south facing slope, uh, just basking, trying to warm themselves up to have a, a bit of activity. And if you're really lucky, I think a little bit later in spring, they do kind of a, a mating dance and they all kind of, yeah, this is me, this is me dancing here, uh, sort of writhing around each other, which I've, which I've never seen, but that would be, you know, a great thing to look, look out for. And I say, if, if you do happen to see any, any adders in Gwent, you know, I'm sure we'd like to hear about it, particularly uh, Sue Breck, uh, would love to, love to have your records. And then we have, uh, again, it's a common lizard. This is up at our Silent Valley Reserve, and it looks as if it's been run over, but it hasn't been run over. It's just uh, really spreading out its body and its legs out to one side, just a sunbathe and really trying to get as much, much to the sort of early spring sun rays on it, just to warm it up, it's cold blooded. Once it's warmed up, it can, uh, can go about its business. That sounded more like a strimmer to me, but that was a that was a bumblebee. So uh, we have the queens just sort of coming out now. They'll have sort of hibernated away the winter, maybe down like an old mouse's hole or something, just sort of hidden away. And then they all it takes is the first bit of warmth, really. And quite often, like the first real sign of sign of spring is like a bumblebee on the on the wing. So they'll they, they'll be starting to make their nests now. They'll be going to like the early season flowers, getting their getting their nectar, and then they'll start laying their eggs and they'll get breed like a whole batch of workers to go and do their go and do their bidding for them sort of uh, throughout the summer so probably it's probably may time before the first first of her babies will be will be out you can see she's got some mites on her head there which must be must be annoying to be honest but there we go so yeah there's a this is a buff tailed bumblebee they're one of the earliest ones out there's also one called the early bumblebee which will be around around now as well and gradually more and more will be on the wing as uh, as spring progresses right there we go any questions on hibernating beasties no questions but lots of people mentioning what they've been seeing recently oh brimstones, right i'd love to know brimstones and peacock butterflies and uh, lots of queen bees red admirals someone's talking about um Putting corrugated iron down as well for slow worms as well to encourage them in the garden. Yeah. Um, and some sort of kingfisher as well yesterday over the canal. Oh, nice. Yeah, if you put the corrugated iron, I'm sure people probably know, but yeah, corrugated iron or even uh, bits of air, uh, bits of roofing felt. Particularly slow worms love to go under there because they can, they're kind of protected from predation under there. But the corrugated iron or the roofing felt heats up, so they kind of get their, they get their warm boost while still being sort of protected. That gives them a nice place to hide and then obviously you can go up and lift up and have a little peek at them as well kind of thing. If I'm, if I'm out and about and I see anything like that lying down, I have to turn it over just to see what's, see what's lurking. One day there'll be an adder which will give me the fright of my life. But, uh, but I think that they, they tend to maybe bask more on the top kind of thing. But uh, probably slow worms and, and grass snakes are the ones people are most likely to have in their garden. So again, if you can put down, you know, things for them to bask under or bask on, and then for, particularly for grass snakes, if you can have a, a compost heap, that's where they love to lay their, lay their eggs. And uh, the slow worm is very much a gardener's friend as well. They, they, eat, they eat basically slugs and stuff. So if you can have a thriving population of slow worms in your garden, then, then all your, your lettuces should, uh, should survive a bit better. So everyone's there. Uh, Everyone's a winner if you've got a slow worm in your garden. Righty ho, this is the last. Oh, no. Yeah, no, I was just going to say just a 10 minute warning. I know you won't believe it, but just really? 10 minutes left. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think I had a, I thought this was going to be over in about 10 minutes. So I was going to be off there. <laughs> off with my feet up. Right, early spring flowers, we're going to race through. So uh, at the moment, a few of our more sort of hardy flowers are starting to peek through. And you may be able to notice a bit of a colour theme with uh, 
with the early season one. So we've got things like Lesser Celandine, Blackthorn Blossom, Colts Foot, Dandelions, Willow and Hazel Catkins and Primrose. So we've got here on the left, we've got the Lesser Celandine. I think you'd struggle to go for a walk in the countryside now and not see any Lesser Celandine. It's like a relation of the, of the buttercups. But all our like hedge banks now and our woodlands are sort of dotted with these little little yellow stars everywhere, which are which are great. And if you're heading along, you probably notice in all the hedgerows now, every so often there'll be one one bush in the hedgerow which is like just bright white now, and that'll be that'll be blackthorn. Uh, because the hawthorn probably won't come into flower for maybe another another month. So it's all it's all blackthorn blossom now, which is a great sort of early season resource for all the pollinators and then it'll have the slows later on in the year for your gin and then here we've got we've got on the left we've got colt's foot which is a, a relation of of the dandelion but they're one of the very first flowers to come out and that they their flowers come up before their leaves so they look a bit a bit unusual and uh but when the leaves come out their that leaf looks like a, a horse's foot so that's where it's that's colt's foot's names from and then we've got the hazel catkins there, which you'll again see in hedgerows dangling down to little lamb's tails. And then we've got the dandelions, which lots of people hate having in their gardens and they rip them out. But they're one of the few sources of, of their sort of nectar for like our early bumblebees and stuff. So if you can leave the, leave the dandelions in your garden, that's great. And then all the seeds later on obviously help you tell the time, but also all the seeds are great for your know, goldfinches coming down in your garden. Then we've got our willow catkins there and then we've got primroses as well but as you can see a lot of the very early season flowers all seem to be sort of yellow and i meant to look up why that is and i have looked it up before and i've forgotten so don't ask me there we go <laughs> but yeah there seems to be very, it always seems to be like early early seasons whites whites and yellow seems to be the theme and then when you get into summer you have more sort of pinks and purples and reds that's sort of how it is Right. I almost had to tell the Skylark to shut up there. I didn't realize it was going to play for so long, but it's nice to hear a Skylark. Uh, so this is competition time. So hopefully, springtime, restrictions are going to be released a bit and we can get out in a bit and a great place to go over the uplands and I'm saying this because we have a, a competition at the moment which is I can't actually I have to move I've got things in the way of it I can't actually read what it says there we go uh, we have our hill life through a lens competition uh, so that runs until May the 3rd it's been running for about a year I think but obviously people haven't had much opportunity to get out and, and do much but if you do, there's this photography competition. Uh, entries in before May the 31st. There's all details there. If you go on our website, you'll be able to find it. But yeah, if you can get out in the uplands and take some photographs, like this is this is a photograph of Silent Valley by Jane Corey, one of our fantastic volunteers. And that's a superb photograph, really. It's all the bluebells there. And if you go up to Silent Valley in May, this is what it looks like, and there'll be Pied fly catches and red starts flashing about there and all sorts of great stuff. But yeah, if you want to get out, take some photographs and enter our enter our competition. That would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, and now, I'm sure most of you are members, but I'd be in trouble with other people if I didn't say, if you're not a member, please join us. So uh, obviously. So the money that we get from our members is absolutely vital to us. Yeah, helps us care for our reserves, helps us campaign against like damage and developments. Like you know, we're successful along with a team of other people preventing the uh, the M4 uh, surveys for rare endangered species, education for children, adults alike, and even putting on nights like this. You know, it, it's it's the members' money which helps us to fund all of this. So if you're not a member, please join. You'll get some lovely magazines and we've got 33 nature reserves you can visit 365 days a year and we've got all our events which will hopefully will run later on in the year and you get discounts so if you're not a member please join right and just to say this is just the beginning 
So if you haven't had enough of me tonight, I've probably had enough on my own voice for tonight, but in two weeks' time, you may have recovered. So if you'd like to come back in two weeks, we'll have the second of our talks on the 1st of April. There will be no April Fool's jokes. It'll all be proper scientific facts. And there we go. That's the end. I've got four minutes left. How did that happen? That's been really brilliant, Andy. Thank you so much. I think um, there's some thanks coming in already on the chat. Um, I, uh, I, um, yeah, just just to say thank you to all the people that have tuned in as well. It's great thank to see so much. many faces. Um, and I and Andy and I look forward to seeing everyone's faces again in a couple of weeks on the first of April. Indeed, and I think we've made a recording of this, so hopefully we'll pop this up on our on our website if people want to watch it again i can't imagine where you'd want to hear me again but uh, if you do want to hear me again then, uh, then yeah it should be up there in a couple of days or so and uh i'll actually tell tell all your friends if you did enjoy tonight if you didn't if you didn't enjoy tonight don't tell your friends but if you did tell them and hopefully more people can tune in for tune in for the next one so yeah just to add we've got a um during the first lockdown, we we uh, created a Gwent Wildlife Spotters Facebook group, oh, yes. um, and that's a really good place if you are out and about on your day walks and you don't know what it is that you're seeing and you manage to capture photos. Um, it's a really good place to put your photos and ask the the whole community what what it is that you've seen, and it helps everyone's learning. So do do have a uh, have a look at that as well, um, or send them into the trust, and uh, Andy can uh, can help you ID them as well. I always like that. I'm writing a report and it's a welcome break. So uh, yeah, please send them in. It's all good. All right. With that, thanks so much, Andy. And we look forward to seeing right, you right. in a couple of weeks. Cheerio, everybody. Bye-bye.